Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium as we're going to continue our discussion on ChatGPT. Now, in a few of my last videos, I've described ChatGPT as a whole, as well as step two and step three. So in this video, I want to talk about what is the GPT behind ChatGPT actually mean. So I'm going to be delving into this first step a little more concretely, highlighting the what is ChatGPT, why do we use it, and how is it trained all in this video. So I hope you get a pretty clear understanding of what that is by the end. And so let's get to it. So let me start by just doing an entire pass over this architecture. In this first step, we basically have a GPT architecture that has been pre-trained. And so it has an understanding of language because it is a language model. We now want to fine tune this model to be able to understand user prompts and be able to respond to some user question. And so what we would do is we would have labelers to create label data. They would provide an input prompt question, and they would also provide the required response to that question. And we use that to fine tune the pre-trained generative pre-trained transformer model, our GPT model. And so we get a supervised fine tuned transformer model, which is the SFT here. Using the supervised model, we'll pass in an unseen prompt and generate multiple responses from this prompt. Then we'll have a labeler rank these responses in the order of how high quality they think they are. And the ranks are also going to be numbers that are assigned to each and every single response. So it's not just what D is greater than C, greater than A, greater than B, but it's going to be like on a scale of one to seven, which is a Likert scale, they are going to be ranking these responses. And then it's these ranks along with the input user prompt and the corresponding responses that are used to train a rewards model. The rewards model, which is used later on, is going to be used to tell us how high quality was this response for a specific input prompt. Now we're going on to step three, where we'll take some unseen user requests, we'll pass it through our normal supervised fine-tuned transformer model, which we constructed in step one, and then we'll generate a response. And this response is generated one word at a time. We then pass this response along with the input prompt into our rewards model. It's gonna output a number that says, how high quality was this response? Let's call that R. And then we push that back into the model in order to fine tune its parameters. So we're essentially going to fine tune the supervised fine tune model. And if we do this over a number of iterations, we'll see that this model gets better and better in terms of like having intrinsic human values, like being factual or also just non-toxic. And this model will eventually become the chat GPT that we know and love today. So that's going to do it for this overall first pass. And if you want more details specifically on the rewards model, what that is, I have a video on that. And also the proximal policy optimization, which is the PPO technique that's used in reinforcement learning. I also have a video on that. So please do check them out for more details. And like I said at the beginning of the video, I'm going to be highlighting specifically how we construct the GPT model to begin with and what is GPT. So let's get to that. So the source of like GPT kind of comes from the transformer neural network architecture, which was introduced in 2017, which was a sequence to sequence architecture. So it would take in as an input some sequence and it would output another sequence. Now in the field of natural language processing, this can actually be super useful because sentences are a sequence of words. And so we started to use these transformers for, well, NLP problems like translation. And I'm gonna walk through exactly how that goes here. So the transformer architecture has two parts. It has an encoder and a decoder. The encoder is going to take all the inputs simultaneously. And within this, it's going to actually create some vectors for each of these words, or I should say word pieces, since there's going to be four, that we have four vectors over here. Now these four vectors are going to be passed in simultaneously into this decoder architecture. And we're probably going to have, when starting out, we'll have like a start token. And then it's going to now run through the decoder and it's going to output one word at a time. 
In this case, let's say that the, the problem that we're trying to do is translation from English to an Indian language, specifically a South Indian language called Kannada. So this is going to be fun. I'm going to teach you a few things here, okay, about Kannada. So my name is Ajay. So the first word that's probably going to be generated by this, hypothetically, if it's completely trained well and it's working properly, is going to be, let's see, Nanna which is uh, translation, the Kannada word for my, and then name is a J. So after this first word is generated, this word is now going to be the input for the next pass. And so we input it here. And then in this next pass, we'll generate the next word here, which is supposed to be Hesaru. This, this actually means name. And then for the third pass, it's going to generate the next word, which is a J. Now, what this actually kind of shows is that this overall architecture has some semblance or understanding of language. And in fact, we figured out that simply the encoder part up here and the decoder part individually also have some understanding of language. And so we can pick them apart, stack them up in order to have them understand more and more parts and intricacies of language. So if you stack just the encoder pieces together, you get a bi-directional encoder representation of transformers which is BERT, and hence that entire research field that's gone into it. And if you take the decoder part and stack them up, you'll get generative pre-trained transformers, which is GPT. And we're gonna be focusing more on these GPT architectures moving forward. So I hope the what is GPT over here kind of makes more sense right now. Now that we have the what out of the way, why exactly are we using GPT architectures over, let's say, I don't know, recurrent neural networks or any other typical modeling strategy that we used in the past. Well, if we wanted to typically train a supervised model, we would need to train all of these model parameters from scratch. And we do this by collecting a lot of labeled data. Unfortunately though, with each and every single one of these tasks mentioned, you need to create a lot of, get a lot of labeled data feed it into your model to train it and to learn those parameters. But this is actually going to be extremely hard to find in very large quantities. And even if it does find the plethora, the huge vast amounts of stores of labeled data, it'll probably only be able to answer one of these major domains at a time. And so to solve this issue, we want to adopt a modeling strategy where we're doing some generative pre-training followed by some discriminative fine tuning phase. Now we'll have a model where we want to do some generative pre-training, which is the unsupervised approach to learn about language modeling. Language modeling here is the type of problem that we're actually optimizing for. Then we have discriminative fine tuning, which is a supervised approach to learn very specific tasks. So in this case, it could be like question answering or document classification or simply user response generation, like a chatbot. And so now that we have some understanding of why we need a GPT architecture, let's actually play out what generative pre-training and discriminative fine tuning actually mean in practice. In order to do generative pre-training, the goal is to optimize for the problem of language modeling. Now, if we wanna make GPT a language model, language models have an understanding of word sequences. Its main objective is to predict what word is going to come next, given the context of all the previous words that have come before it. Mathematically represented, that's exactly what this is, but we'll get to that. So let's say that we have one training example where we just basically scour the internet for random sentences. One of those sentences is, today I want to play. Now we have a start token, which we now input to this untrained GPT architecture. When we start, we want to say, okay, right here, we wanted to generate the word today. Once we generate today, we're going to now put that as the input for the next time step where we pass it into GPT and it should do its little magic in here and try to predict I. Now we're going to, every single time we do this, we want to tune the parameters such that it is more likely to produce this word I. In the next time step, we want to generate the word want. Then in the next time step two, and then in the next time step, play. 
Now, mathematically speaking, we want GPT to be optimizing some objective. This is typical of all of machine learning and deep learning. And the objective we're trying to optimize is that of a language modeling objective, where we want to try to predict the next word, which is WI. In this case, let's say this entire sentence is W. So WI would be play using all of the previous words that came before it using the words today I want to. And theta here are the parameters of this GPT architecture. And this overall statement across all of the words is something that we want to maximize. And so theta will have the parameters that will maximize this objective. And so I hope this relationship between what's happening in intuitively and also mathematically makes a lot more sense. Now, at the end of this generative pre-training phase, we're going to get a model that has some inherent understanding of language. And more practically speaking, it's going to be able to generate, well, given a word sequence, it will be able to figure out what word to generate next. Now, in the discriminative fine-tuning phase, we now have a general model, but we want to make it satisfy or solve a very specific problem. For example, in document classification, simply giving the next word is not enough. We actually want to understand the overall sentiment of the document of what it represents. Or we want to understand a categorization. Is it a sports document? Is it as a news document? Is it some other type of document? And so typically we would have this pre-trained architecture and add probably like a very simple linear layer randomly initialized and then have a very small amount of actual training data for document classification to basically learn these small sets of parameters and further fine tune the rest of this model. Now, because there's only a small amount of new parameters and also like most of these parameters in the GPT model already have a good understanding of language, you don't need too many of these, these pairs or these supervised pairs of um, examples for document classification. And this is what makes it so much easier to actually just get started with so many of these facets of natural language processing using just simply a pre-training and fine-tuning um, kind of argument or phase. Now with Chatbot and ChatGPT, the input is some user prompt and the output is a response. And that's already kind of the format in which G GPT architectures are already fine-tuned. And so all we would need to do is we don't even need to add very new parameters as we did, you know, for document classification, but we can get extra examples of user prompts and their corresponding responses that are required in order to further just fine tune this specific model where we're just going to be tuning these parameters. And it's actually this that we kind of see where in the first step of chat GPT, the label or demonstrates the desired output behavior and it fine tunes via supervised learning. Now to get a more concrete idea of exactly what's going on over here, let's look at this figure. In normal GPT, uh, we would typically pass in, um, let's say one token and GPT will generate one token at a time. So typically it'll be, let's say that we generated three words, today I will. Now this is going to be passed to GPT in this fourth time step. And eventually it's going to generate uh, a vector, which is going to be of the size vocab size cross one. And I guess like in the later versions of GPT, this vocab size is the number of possible tokens that we could possibly generate in this specific language by GPT. These tokens are not exactly words, but they are word pieces so that this vocab size doesn't doesn't skyrocket to be of the order of infinite number of values because there's just that many words. The vocab size is like around 50,000 or something like that. And this is actually going to be applied to a soft max. And the reason we do this is we want to make this entire thing a probability distribution. So the total value is going to sum to one. And when it's a probability distribution, it's going to signify what is the probability that each of these tokens is going to be used as the next word. Now, obviously we can only choose one of them and we don't typically choose the top one with the highest probability because that just sounds less natural and not superhuman. Instead, we use a sampling technique. This can include like temperature sampling or nucleus sampling or top K sampling, which I've explained in some other videos. And you can sample basically from this 
softmax in order to determine what the next word should be. Let's say that the word that we generated or the word that we kind of picked was the word play. And so play is going to be the next word that's generated. And hence you'll get a response today, I will play by ChatGPT. And this is also why you kind of see ChatGPT generate one word at a time. The, this ability actually comes from the underlying GPT architecture. And in fact, just to make it even more concrete, I'm gonna do a direct comparison with ChatGPT. And so let's say that you, you ask a question, what will you do today? ChatGPT might respond with today, I will, um, as the first three words. And maybe during the fourth word, again, it's gonna go through the GPT architecture, create this huge vector of vocab size cross one. It's then going to sample from this probability distribution. It's converted into a probability distribution because of softmax. And then we'll sample from that to get the next word. And so, I hope now this creates an even better picture of what is going on behind ChatGPT and how big of a deal GPT is within ChatGPT. I also wanna hammer home the point that like ChatGPT didn't just come out of thin air. It's very clearly based on many concepts of language modeling, of transformer neural networks, of GPT architectures that have come before it, and so much more. I'm actually gonna make an, another video or probably a couple of videos just illustrating some more architectural details of GPT itself, because I just think it's so important in the landscape of how we do natural language processing today. But with that, thank you all so much for watching. Please do ask any questions you have down below, correct anything you think that I've gotten wrong. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.